Hello and welcome to the screencast on using R to do model diagnostics for simple linear models in R. Now there's a great, uh, qu quite an extensive literature on once you fit a linear model, whether it's analysis of variance, analysis of covariance, regression, multiple regression, what have you, uh, in any of the family of the general linear model, uh, a large literature on diagnostics. In other words, let's think about what can go wrong and how much things have gone wrong, which often frightens people because there's so many things to do, and certainly you will find something that will make suggest, uh oh, I've uh, this particular assumption has been violated. Do I have a problem? Now, often, especially for larger sample sizes, many of the assumptions are um, the linear model is fairly robust to many assumptions. Less so for others. So, for uh, lack of independence among observations, for instance, that's one that is a no-no, and you'll have real problems for, as well as a few few others that we'll talk about. So by no means will this very short screencast go into all of this. So we're going to use the uh, model that we've been using pretty much all along, or one of, one of the models we've been using all along, looking at the relationship between uh, sex comb teeth and the length of tarsus from Drosophila fruit flies. Uh, and we're using the, uh, we're, we're running this uh, from a tutorial we've already, we, we've already done, so you want to call in that same data set and uh, call in um, uh, fit this the model which was called regression.2 and we're in the GLM review part 1 2012 lecture and just to remind you of what that model fit the call was we're looking at sex comb teeth model is a function of uh, tarsus length and we centered tarsus length and that was described in the previous screencast why we did that uh, and of course we got our coefficients and we got our standard errors and everything one thing that we did notice uh, initially just looking at these residuals we would, we would hope that our, for our residuals, the median would be reasonably close to zeros, and that the mins and maximums, or the quantiles, would be of approximately the same order. So min and max should be about the same magnitude, and opposite in sign, same for the uh, interquartile distance, the interquartiles. And it's a little off. It's hard to know from negative 4 and negative 11. Is that really bad, or is it not bad at all? It's hard to know. So we're going to take a little bit of a look, and look at some of our uh, pre-built and functions and, and make some of our own that will hopefully help us. So it turns out that if you have a linear model object and you say plot to that name to that object in R, it will actually by default give you some plot output. Uh, normally it's interactive so it'll give you one plot at a time. I prefer to look them all at the same time so I'm just going to make my um, palette be a two by two uh, image window and then I'll plot all of them simultaneously. And what do we get? Well, we get a plot of four things. One is the residuals versus fitted values. So these are the residuals for your response versus the fitted values for your response. Uh, that's the top left. Top right is your uh, quantile plot. So it's your standardized re residuals versus your theoretical residuals. In other words, what we'd expect if they were normally distributed, given a particular a mean of zero and, and the variance based on, on uh, the residual standard error of the model versus what's actually observed for the residuals. If uh, your residuals are normal, they should all fall along the line. When they deviate from that, it suggests there's some lack of normality in your data. Similarly, in the top left plot, the residuals versus fitted, this is one of a uh, couple of ways of actually being able to evaluate whether you see any patterns of, first of all, nonlinearity in your data. Um, in this case, that, that uh, cubic spline that's fit through it, the red line, uh, is pretty much straight. So that doesn't su suggest it. But it's also a good way of looking to see if there's any heterogeneity in, in, in uh, the residual variance um, across uh, the, the distribution of fitted values in this case. And we'll come back to it, but you can do this similar plot of residuals, but instead of doing it against fitted values, you can do those residuals against each of the predictor variables to see if there's any relationships left. Um, the top left is a scale location plot, which is just the standardized, uh, it's the standardized residuals, the square root of them, against fitted values. And this is, again, another useful way to look at, at uh, particular patterns of nonlinearity. You're going to see some wonky things going on here um, that don't look well distributed. And in this case, that's largely because sex comb teeth is actually taking on discrete values. Uh, the residuals versus leverage plot, this is essentially a way of asking how each point, um, how much potential influence they can have. Uh, and there's a nice little aspect to this, which they have, you can see in the bottom left corner of the bottom right plot, something called Cook's distance. And you can't even really see it on here, but it's basically saying how far out um, is, 
are these distances, and if you get beyond, I apologize, there we go, uh, if you get beyond a, a certain level, and I think the Cook's distance, the, the dashed line usually is at Cook's distance of 0.05 or 0.5, I can't quite remember right now, when you go beyond that line, the rule of thumb is okay, these observations can have strong influences, potentially you might want to consider how they're influencing your model, maybe trying your model with and without them to make sure your, your results don't change too much. Okay, well that's sort of the, the base ones, and I'll assume that you've already read up on these. That's not my goal for this. Um, my goal is more to, to broaden your idea, and so also to remind ourselves that there's two separate goals here. One is model, dog, model diagnostics to make sure that um, we haven't violated assumptions too badly for the kind of model we're fitting, and the other one is model evaluation or criticism, which the Gelman and Hill book talk at great length about. And here's one example of a plot that the Gelman and Hill book suggests doing, which is fitting, uh, doing a scatter plot essentially of your observed response variable, which in this case is sex home teeth, versus your fitted variable. If you've done a good job of fitting these two, they should be strongly correlated, and if you haven't, they're going to be pretty noisy. And you can sort of fit them in such a way so that they're along a one-to-one -one line. So I've fit it so the x and y axes have the same ranges, uh, and we can just ask the question, and this will be just in the top corner of this one, how uh, how well do they fit? Are they on this line? And as you can see, we have lots of variation, observed variation, relatively little variation for fitted, and they certainly don't lie well along that line. What this tells us is about uh, evaluating or criticizing our model. Have we done a good job of accounting for variation in sex cone T? And clearly the answer here is no. This is sort of a plot version of the coefficient of determination, but often this becomes much more useful to sort of remind yourself of it because a lot of people can get very excited. Look, I have a coefficient of determination of 0.08 or 0.09. I'm explaining 8 or 9% of the variance uh, in the observed data and the observed response. For some variables, that's fine. For some, it's not. But this gives you an idea of overall how well your model is doing it. And in this case, that's not a great surprise. We're only looking at one of the predictor of, of many, and we'll come back to that later. Um, but that's not so much model. Um, that's, that doesn't so much evaluate the diagnostics as much as it's evaluating overall fit, which is a somewhat separate goal here, but we should always keep both in mind when we're doing these things. Okay, but back to my model diagnostics. So one thing I like to do is plot the histogram of the residuals. This is uh, not, not unlike the QQ plot, this sort of can give us an idea of, of uh, do we have some lack of normality here? And here's one way of, of, of doing that, and you can change the, we, we've uh, previously in these screencasts talked about histograms and changing breaks or using the density uh, function instead, so we can get a, a smoothing function to get, to get an idea. But it looks not too far from normal. We could play around with it with the breaks to see what's going on. It doesn't look too bad. It's a little right skewed, and that was consistent with the, um, with the QQ plot as well. There's several other plots that we want to consider doing here. So one thing I like to do is, well, we so far have only fit the regression dot two uh, we, for that model. We've only accounted for variation in sex comb tooth number as a function of tarsus. But we know that there are other predictors that we need to consider, for instance, temperature and genotype, as well as line. So let's just do a box plot of the residuals. So once we've accounted for um, variation in sex comb teeth as a function of tarsus, how much variation is left and how does that relate to these other variables of interest? So we can do plots of these. So here is the first one where we're looking at the different genotype by temperature combinations for a box plot. And we can see that, um, not surprisingly, the residuals are centered reasonably close to zero, but they're bouncing around and there's clearly a lot of variation we haven't accounted for. Um, and there's definitely some shifts away from zero. And again, this is uh, residual variation, this isn't about, uh, this doesn't tell us anything about estimates for these things, but it suggests maybe we should consider modeling them, but maybe they're not having a huge effect. We can do the same thing for, for line, and these are the 28 or 26 strains, however many we used here, um, uh, for this study. And here it's, it becomes somewhat clear that you see a lot of bouncing around. Again, we're on the y-axis is the residuals, and the x-axis is different lines. We're looking at blocks, plots of the residuals. Uh, condition on lines. And it can give us some idea. And clearly there's something here and line is probably an important thing to to look at. Alright. 
So let's assume for the moment that there were a couple of outliers that we wanted to worry about. Let's just say that they were two particular outliers that we found in the data set, a negative 14, uh, observation in row uh, 1479 and 1480. You can, you can take a look at those if you want. They're not particularly strong outliers. I just want to show you one way of, of dealing with that. If you have potential outliers, one thing you can do is run the model with and without it. And thankfully, the subset function in LM allows you to basically say, in addition to subsetting like the, the general function does, you can basically say, let's just remove some particular observations from here. And you can uh, rerun the, the models and ask, okay, how does that change things uh, from here? And so we can run this. And I think I have, I'm not sure if I've already run regression one. I have, so there's the coefficients for regression one, 6.08 and 26.9. We do the same thing for uh, the model with the outliers. It really doesn't change things particularly a tiny, tiny bit, not too much. And we could look at the standard errors and whatever. But at least qualitatively, we feel reasonably confident to better estimates with and without those outliers. Okay, one of the most important um, assumptions in the linear model is independence among observations. And we have ways of correcting for that. But if, for instance, you have an important predictor in the model and you have not included, you have not actually fit it in the model, you know it's, maybe you know it's there or maybe you don't know it's there, um, you're, you're basically not accounting for some lack of independence among your, um, your observed, your observations. Uh, so here's a particular example I want to point out. Now I want to make the point that our data set is already sorted essentially by line. So this this approach sort of relies on already having the data set sorted in a particular way to, to look at it, but it's, it's a way if you think that a particular predictor is important and may be contributing to lack of independence among observations, this can do it. So we're going to use the autocorrelation function, and we're just going to look at the autocorrelation among those residuals. And if there was complete independence among our observations, what we would expect to see is that this lag of zero, which is a correlation of the residuals on themselves would be one, and then it would drop off precip precipitously and essentially be floating in and around this range down here this whole time. But what we see is there's sort of this diminishing function and sort of may go even up and down a little bit. It's hard to tell over there. And that suggests that there's actually some autocorrelation that we have not deal dealt with, suggesting that there's a predictor that we need to include. In this case, that predictor is almost certainly line effect. Um, one thing we could do then is let's take a look at our model. Instead of, we'll, we'll write a new model. Here, I'll, I'll put it in here. I just realized it's not in here, but that's not a problem. We're going to call this new.model for the moment. And we're going to model sub six cum teeth as a function not only of, uh, I think it's sent.tarsus plus, and we'll just do line for the moment. And data equals dll.data, this should run OK. So we've got to run our new model. So we can even go, let's take a look at our, our uh, some of our assumptions, model assumptions. So we're going to create a new uh, plotting window, and we're just going to plot, do the standard plot for LM. Oops. And what do we see? Well, in fact, um, it's hard to solve for residual fitted. We may be getting even slightly more right skew here with this QQ plot. It's a little bit hard to tell. We could certainly here uh, do the histogram of the residuals for new model. And again, here we can see a little bit of that right skew, maybe a little bit more. But what I wanted to do instead is you look at the autocorrelation among observations here. This is just called new.model. And we do that. And what happens? Well, we see that the degree of autocorrelation has gone down considerably. It's still maybe a little higher than we'd like over here, but it's definitely gone down. So let's just try one final model. We'll call it new.new.model or something. And we're going to add in here. Uh, do not remind myself of the, of the variable names of data, so I just don't remember. Uh, so genotype and temp. So we'll add those in. I won't worry about interactions for the moment. I'll just fit this model. 
And again, we can plot this. Oh. But I go through that. Let me move on those two so we can get it. Nice and there we go. And we sort of see the same picture here, so this hasn't changed anything that substantially here. How about for our ACF? And this looks much like what we saw before. So it seems like we can reduce it to a certain extent, but we can't get everything out. Now there's a few other factors we could, predictors that we could look at. In fact, it's not new predictors as much as it's new interactions among the original predictors. So in other words, we're doing a basis expansion. But for now, we're not going to worry about it. All right. Um, I think that's really all I wanted to talk about and give you some ideas about for this. Um, I think we've covered all the other things. So thank you.